Good morning, everybody. Um, give me a couple minutes. I'm gonna let everybody get logged in. And while they're doing that, I'm gonna get myself organized. It's already been a hectic morning. I just got here. I've got a sick dog at the vet. So I just talked to that. She's good. She's our little four pound, 14 year old chihuahua, but she's fine. So um, give me a minute to get everything. All right, that's the last bit of my caffeine for the morning. Um, I also put in the um, chat box, I don't usually give out handouts ahead of time, but I put links to these documents in the um, chat box. So if you wanna go there and click on those links, you can get the slides, but there's also two flow charts that I'm gonna use um, that will be helpful. And we'll go through them in the second part of the web, webcast about the ERC, that employee retention credit. So I put those up there um, for everybody because I think it, I, I just, I feel like this employee retention credit, which I also keep calling the employer retention credit, which is not right, um, is very, very complicated. Um, the credit part is easy. The What's complicated is the um, eligibility piece of it. All right, and then I need to get all my stuff open. So like I said, everybody's still logging in and I'm getting myself set up. All right, so we'll start on that one. All right, business. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, oh, they don't, okay, you guys don't see the links up above in chat. Oh, you know why? Because it's to all panelists. Okay, let, give me a minute. Let me repost them um, to all attendees. Sorry, guys. Uh, slides. I got them right over here. Let me get these links. Okay. Uh, Hmm. Wait a minute. Let me, that one that I just posted that said slides, that is actually one of the handouts. I told you it's been a morning already. So I'm gonna redo this. Slides for real. Well, that might've been the slides. I'm confused on the links that it's given me. It's okay. We'll get them. Actions, create link. Copy. And this one is 20. And, uh, yes, and this way I can label them better too. I didn't label them very good last time. Okay. And then one more. If you're just jumping online, I am still getting myself together. It's been quite a morning. Um, and I am posting in chat the slides, which look like they're posted a couple of times. It's fine, they're the same link. And then um, two different handouts for this employee retention credit. It's super complicated. So these are like flow charts where you can get there and say, did this happen? Yes or no. And I think that'll help a lot in making the uh, determination if you're eligible or not. Um, the eligibility is what is super complicated. When I say complicated, what I mean is that my little group of CPAs, we've been arguing it amongst each other, like how you word it and what it means. And it's um, typical non-accountant government writing regulation. 
and that like they say something then we got to interpret it and figure out how to make it a, a, a rule and how to enforce not enforce it but you know do it so anyways that's it's pretty um confusing to say the least so all right i've got everything pulled up i think we've got most of our people um online so i'm gonna go ahead and share my screen we've got a good audience today so bear with me um how do i go to presentation mode there we go swap settings all right you guys should just see my big you know not like next slide and all that if if that's not what you see could you hit me in chat and say yeah we still see the wrong side apologize usually i'm here i'm set up about 10 minutes early but i have a sick chihuahua at the vet and so they called right before i was ready to get online and so i wanted to just take care of that real quick and so i'm a little bit scrambling <clears throat> All right, looks like everything's good to go. So let's get started. Thank you guys for joining me on my Wednesday webcast. We do this the first Wednesday of every month. <clears throat> I've toyed with the idea of kind of pausing uh, through busy season a little bit, which is the next couple of months, but I'm not sure. It, it takes me about four hours a month and I can spare that kind of time usually. Um, but today I, I'm just trying to go over anything that's relevant. And today what's relevant is PPP2 loans. We'll also talk about round one and those that can didn't get it originally, but can get it now. So we'll go over that. There's not a lot of details on that. It, that all of that is actually fairly straightforward. And then we'll dig into this employee retention credit. Um, <clears throat> it was really ignored by most I don't want to say most people, but for me and, and all of my guidance that I've given out to you all in my audience, I've kind of ignored it because originally, if you got a PPP loan, you were excluded from the ERC credit. <clears throat> that has changed. So that opens up a whole new door of planning and opportunity there. And so I want to talk about that and how it impacts everybody who's eligible and those kinds of things. So this is all timely information. Um, I do not anticipate talking about HHS provider relief funds. There's no change there. Um, if you want to know the latest, I recommend going and looking at um, the webcast from my prior episodes on YouTube. All of our videos are on YouTube channel. Um, just search the Night CPA, not the Search Night CPA group. Um, subscribe and you'll be alerted anytime we post a new video and as things develop and come out you know we may not wait until a Wednesday webcast we may put something out there right away and so um, that's that's a great way to really follow us um, and a lot of times I'll also send it out in an email but you know those emails get lost in your um, promotions folder or spam or junk or just you know you think it's trash so I always forget to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Amy Knight, Knight CPA Group. We are a CPA firm. We're located in Austin, Texas. We work with providers across the country. We're really predominantly in Texas and Oklahoma. And um, I'm from Oklahoma, I'm still a Sooner. And um, so this is what we do. We only do home health, hospice, nursing home, assisted living. So this is kind of our world and it's what we like to you know, stay, stay up with. So let's talk about real quick, the changes that happened to round one, what, which is what we're calling it, the original PPP loan program. Um, the big news that came out is that there is no tax event due to forgiveness. <clears throat> Originally, the law was written that it would not be taxable. IRS came in and said, that's cool. We won't tax you on the forgiveness, which is typically income, but we won't let you deduct the expenses. And that was a backdoor way of making it taxable. And so um, that is how the IRS dealt with it late in the year. And it was finally signed into law. I think it was December 26th or 7th. They undid that. Congress came back in and said, look, that was not our intent. And so the way they wrote this new verbiage was very inclusive, basically telling the IRS, no, you will not tax this. Don't try to come in a backdoor and tax it. It's not taxable. 
So what that means is you get to fully deduct the expenses that were paid with the PPP loan proceeds, and you do not have to claim income on the forgiveness. So people ask, well, what if I don't have forgiveness this year? Doesn't matter. 2020 payroll is most likely what you spent those funds on. That is all deductible in 2020. Then if you've got forgiveness, that's great. You're going to want to report it as other income on your financial statement. And then your tax preparer needs to make sure that there is an adjustment on your tax return. So that is not included in your income. You want to make sure they know that. Um, I did just see a question pop up in the Q&A panel, which reminds me, um, please put your questions there. It gives me a method to manage that mark them as answers. So I don't miss anybody. If it gets in chat and chat starts getting deep, I tend to miss them and um, I apologize for that. So one other housekeeping note, tomorrow we will send out, out a follow-up email to everybody that registered, whether they were able to attend or not. Obviously, if you're hearing this, you attended, um, but it's going to have a link to the recording as well as the um, all the materials also. So that'll go out tomorrow, um, sometime tomorrow afternoon, typically. Um, so you will get a copy of the recording. Again, it's on YouTube. It's just a link to the YouTube uh, video. But if you want to share it with anybody, feel free. Um, I'm trying to read the question. OK, I can't. Uh, that, uh, are we qualified? To... So the PP. Um, OK, we'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, which I tend to do sometimes. So not taxable. Great news for everybody out there. Moving on. Um, they also reopened round one. What this means is if you were eligible in round one and did not take a loan, didn't apply for one, didn't take it, or you applied for it, got it, gave it back because you were concerned about necessity, or you got it, used part of it, gave the rest back because you thought you had to spend it in eight weeks, if any of those fit you and you did not utilize the full maximum of the loan that you were allotted, and now you would be able to use it under the new rules, you are eligible to go back and apply for the remainder or the loan in and of itself. Let me give you a few examples. One example, my little sister, she has a very small little meal prep business. She's getting all into charcuterie trays and stuff. Anyways, real small. She got the idle advance, and that was the one where you got this grant of $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. So she got like a $4,000 grant. Well, under the original rules, PPP loan, the forgiveness was going to be reduced by the amount of the grant. Therefore, you're really going to pay back the amount of the grant. So she got $4,000 in a grant that right now on its own is not to be repaid. Her PPP loan would have been like $7,000. Like I said, really small, especially in y'all's world, right? But it's a great example. So I said, look, Caroline, it doesn't make sense for you to get a PPP loan because you're going to have to pay back your $4,000. I mean, yeah, it gives, it, she would have paid back the $4,000 and only had $3,000 forgiven with her PPP loan. So it really didn't kind of benefit her. <clears throat> well, that was in the beginning. And now they changed the rules. So another rule on here, which is actually on the next slide, is that the idle loan no longer reduces your forgiveness, the idle grant. So if you got 4,000, 10,000, and, and, and we were saying, hey, you gotta go to your forgiveness and reduce it by the amount of idle advance that you got, that is gone. So now she's saying, okay, well, I got my $4,000 grant. That's cool, I don't have to pay it back. But I could have got a PPP loan. I qualified. I'm a small business. All the, you know, she can check all the boxes. She needed it. She was in mill services, right? And so we were able to go back now under the reopening of round one and get her PPP loan. So now she gets to take advantage of both of those. Here's another example. There was a very large provider we worked with out of the Northeast and a very large private duty and PAS kind of provider. We were working with them when it was under the eight week rule, right? There was no way because their business was down so much. There was no way they could spend like 
three million of or two million of their loan. It was a big number. Let's just say it was a million dollars. There was a million dollars of their loan that they could not spend according to the rules due to the time construction. And so we looked at that. We said, okay, so under those rules, you're if if you were to bonus this out to everybody, a you're the owner, you're already maxed out. Nothing's going to come to you. Your key employees are already maxed out. Can't do any more bonus to them. So you're going to bonus all of your field staff. You're going to spend a million dollars just to spend it. You're going to be stuck with a three hundred thousand dollar tax bill. How? Where's the benefit in that, right? So for them, the only decision was to give back that million dollars. Like I don't want it. I don't even want it as a one percent loan. Well, if if that decision was made under these new this new opening of round one. She could now go back and say, hey, I want that other million that I returned because since it's opened up to 24 weeks, then I could have easily spent it in 24 weeks. So this is just such an interesting situation where a law was made and then the rules change and the rules change and the rules change all after the fact. So that being said, that's why they've reopened round one They've got 35 billion set aside specifically for nobody that has borrowed yet. I don't think that money is going very fast at all. Meaning it's not like getting spent up and, oh my God, if I don't do it today, I'm not going to get any. We're not seeing any of that kind of activity going on. So if you fall into that, you're eligible to go back and apply for round one, either what you gave back or what you didn't take. There were some groups that... Um, you know, we're eligible, but then they were concerned about this necessity rule saying, do you really need this to continue ongoing operations? That is still a rule, but with all the uncertainty and it all happened very quick. And there was like Ruth Chris and some large restaurant chains that got really hammered in the media by taking that money. Um, some people gave it back at that time because they were like, I, I don't, I don't know if I qualify and stuff. And if you later feel like I did qualify and I want to go back and, and recoup or whatever, then, then that is open to you guys. They've also increased what expenditures you can um, use for your PPP loan. This is kind of a moot point for our audience. Let me explain. So They've increased where you can include in your PPP loan allowable expenses. Once you get the loan, what you can spend it on is business software, um, which includes like payroll, anything to make you cloud-based is deductible. Um, I say deductible, allowable. Um, also, this one's interesting to me, property damage caused because of public disturbances that was not covered under insurance. Basically, if you're in a city that got rioted and you experienced damage, they're gonna cover it. Um, and then supplier cost. And then on the next screen is PPE, right? Here's the thing. A lot of you guys all got HHS provider relief funds to cover some of those expenditures. Anything that was extra due to COVID, that's what you really should be using your HHS provider relief funds on. Also, it is so much easier to do your forgiveness application if you're using 100% payroll. It, it's, it's, it's all allowed, but it's just so much easier on the forgiveness process if it's payroll. Let's say you're with ADP and you're like, look, I spent all my money because I have 24 weeks to spend 10 weeks worth of payroll. There's really nobody that I've come across that wasn't able to spend 10 weeks of 2019 average payroll during 24 weeks during of 2020. Like it's just like you got double the time to spend it. So what we've been doing is just say, let's just count payroll because you can just pull an ADP report and you can show all your wages. It's just, it was much easier than going and digging all your rent bills out, your utility bills, all of that. You had to prove that it was in place before COVID hit. It's just a lot of extra work. Now, if there's anybody watching that's not in home care, that's not in a labor intensive, we do have one client that's a friend of our of a home care friend of ours. And um, he is in some kind of oil and gas pipeline, something, something, totally not home care. He's got a lot of equipment costs, right? And so his labor goes down, but some of his equipment costs we're still carrying. Um, some of these new rules were helping him out drastically. So 
you got to realize that, you know, they're trying to address all industries, not just um, one particular industry. Um, if you haven't, if you've already applied for forgiveness, there's no need to go back and try to include all this. You're not going to get forgiven more than what your loan was. If you spent your loan all on payroll, you're good. No need to go back and try to fix anything. And like I mentioned, this idle grant no longer reduces your forgiveness. Now, there is, uh, SBA has addressed it, this situation where you've already received, you applied for and received forgiveness from your bank, but it was reduced by that $10,000 idle grant. And so now you're paying back on a $10,000 loan. The SBA is supposed to go through and do a reconciliation on their own. Um, that says, hey, we should have forgiven this 10,000, give it back to the client, you know, tells the bank, give it back to the client, plus any payments they made, including interest. So if you, if you're in that situation, you've been paying on a $10,000 loan, um, that should all be refunded to you. If it's not, I would reach out to your bank. They're probably going to tell you they're dealing with round two, but regardless, you need to reach out to your bank and try to get that resolved. The SBA is supposed to do it behind the scenes automatically. Um, but I do know the SBA is quite overwhelmed right now, so I'm not sure how long that process is going to take. Other PPP news, they did do a streamlined forgiveness application for loans under $150,000, um, which what that means to me is they are not going to be doing blanket forgiveness for under $150,000. That might change. I've not heard any talks of it lately in quite a while. So we're moving forward with, okay, it's not going to be blanket forgiveness. We need to go ahead and, and get those applications submitted. Um, it's a simplified form, but you're still required to do and have all of your calculations, all of your documentations readily available. So our recommendation is basically do the regular what we think most people in our niche qualify for is the 3508 EZ um, because of, um, you know, you were, your operations were not able to maintain normally because of COVID. So you qualify under one of those safe harbors. Fill out the full form, have all your documentation, and then just submit this streamlined um, application. That's what we're recommending. I do have a very in-depth forgiveness webinar. I wanna say we did it back in August, July, August. Nothing has really changed since then. So um, I would, if you want to know more about forgiveness, go back and look at that webinar. It was in-depth all about forgiveness. Um, they did come out and clarify that you could select any period between eight weeks and 24 weeks. Some really hard line, hard nose. CPAs in the profession were saying, well, it says eight weeks or 24 weeks, but doesn't say you could do 12 weeks. Well, they clarified, yeah, you can do 12 weeks. Um, and then uh, this is the biggie, even though it's like the last little bullet in this section, you're no longer excluded from the employee retention credit if you receive the PPP loan. Again, you have to really, and we'll get to this, um, but if your revenue is not down, if you don't qualify for a PPP2 loan, which we're going into next, you're not going to qualify for the employee retention credit. There's a pretty, at least for 2020, but if you qualify for round two, you might qualify for the employee retention credit. So let's jump into um, round two PPP loans, because that's what that question is. Um, I got two Chacos, uh, Sean and Rajiv. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at questions. So let's go through round two, and then I'll make sure these two questions are answered because they both relate to that. So, PPP round two, what they're really calling it a second draw, but they're not treating it like a second draw. What they've said is, okay, if you've got a loan and if you've got a PPP loan already, if you received one, you used it all up and you still need more funds, 
if you can prove to us that you had a 25% or more decrease in revenue for any given quarter versus that same quarter in 2019, then you're eligible for a second PPP loan. So it's basically going to be the same amount as the first loan you received. The calculations are the same. It does allow you to use, um, and same thing for the round one that reopened for those that did not take a round one loan. Um, you can use, now you can either use 2019 payroll or 2020 payroll in order to calculate your average weekly payroll. However, depending on your circumstances, so far, if you're down in 2020 because of our industry, if your revenues are down, most likely your payroll is down. So for everybody we've worked with, they're using 2019 payroll cost because that's the higher payroll cost because business was down in 2020, which means payroll was down in 2020. And so if you do the average, you want to use the higher, you know, take your 2019 payroll versus 2020 payroll divided by 12 months, whichever one is higher, that's what you want to use. And then you take your average monthly payroll times two and a half. If for any reason there is somebody on this call, it's on the next slide, um, that is a restaurant, there is a special rule for you guys, hotels and restaurants. So I'll get to that in just a moment. There are a little bit, they've kind of tightened down on the eligibility. You now have to have fewer than 300 employees. This is gonna weed some people out. However, I did get asked this question and I have researched it. They will still allow the alternative SBA size calculation. And what that means, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number. Um, if you fall into this, you need to look it up on your own just to make sure that you qualify. But in our industry of home care, home health, if your receipts, your revenue across your whole group, your total revenue is less than, I think it's $15 million, and you have more than 300 employees, you still qualify as a small business. You qualify under the SBA's alternative method, okay? And so if that's you, you might look that up. Um, just to you know, make sure or give it to your advisor, whoever you're working with. Um, you do have to have used up all of your PP1 or you will use it all up, but unless you got it really late in the year, 24 weeks has expired, so you would have used it all up by now. And you have to be able to show this 25% decline in gross revenue. Let's talk about that for just a second. This is your deposit, your gross revenue, your money in the bank. It is not after payroll is deducted. It is not your net income. You cannot have a negative number for gross receipt for a quarter or a month or any period of time. So if you come to us for help with this, the first thing we're doing because I simply just have to find a way to address as many people at the same time as I can. We, we don't have time to go calculate that for everybody. So what we did was we sent out an Excel workbook. If you inquired, we, the first thing we did, we said, here's an Excel schedule. We made it very, very simple. Please give us your gross receipts for each quarter of 19, each quarter of 20. We calculate the difference. It all calculates for you. It's got instructions on it. It's very simple. We did get some back where they were negative numbers. Well, they were using net income or they were using gross profit. It is gross revenue. So that's your very top number, okay? So um, now in that number, do not count provider relief funds. Do not count PPP loans. Um, I recommend that in your bookkeeping, in your QuickBooks, those two amounts, if they go on your profit and loss or income statement, they go down at the bottom, like in QuickBooks, when you set up a new account and you call it other income, HHS provider relief fund, it's going to ask you what kind of account it is. If you pick other income instead of income, it'll put it way down at the bottom for you. Okay. So it's going to take it out of your regular operating numbers. So you're not confused. Same thing for the PPP loan. Once it's forgiven, that's really where it should go. Um, 
So that's how you calculate this. Again, you're just looking at gross revenue, your top line. If you're accrual basis, it should be accrual basis revenue. If you're cash basis, it should be cash basis revenue. And when I say whatever basis you are, I, my, our position is however you keep your monthly financial statements, not necessarily your tax return. We have most, almost all clients in our world are cash basis taxpayers. That's our recommendation. Um, but we keep a lot of books on a cruel basis. So we're looking at revenue on a cruel basis. Just need to have, be consistent. That way, if um, you were selected for audit, you could justify it. And it didn't look like you were manipulating it to get the right number. You want to be very careful with that. Also, back on that, if you use cash basis for 19, you have to use cash basis for 20. If you use cash basis for one quarter, you have to use it for all and vice versa. So pick a basis and use it for all eight quarters, 19 and 20. Um, you know, so just be careful. Don't, don't try to manipulate the numbers. Um, so the loan size, they did decrease the loan size a lot. It's no longer up to 10 million. Now it's only up to 2 million. This is the same thing. It's two and a half times your average monthly payroll cost from either, and I, this really should say, either 2019 or 2020. So I cannot edit when I'm in presentation mode. I'll try to edit it afterwards. So when these go out, it'll be updated. Um, uh, then, um, sorry, restaurants and hotels. If you're in the hospitality industry, they are actually giving you three and a half times your average monthly payroll cost. You guys have been hit hardest, you've been shut down the longest and all that good stuff. So um, that was an extra little perk there for, for those if we have any in the audience today. Um, so that PPP2, well, that's the whole update on all the PPP loan world. So let me answer these couple of questions. When we apply for second loan, should we select reasons other than payroll for the loan? So when you apply, it asks, what are you gonna use the proceeds for? Um, I, we put payroll on all of them. I don't know that if you select payroll, they're gonna hold you to only payroll. I'm not sure what the point of that question is other than, I, honestly, I think it's real statistical data is what they're using it for. That's just my professional guess though. And that's, you know, for the two cents that it's worth. Um, so I wouldn't, I, like I said, we put it on payroll cause that's all we're using it for. Um, then the other question is, we have remittances for 2019 and 2020 is almost the same amount, but the remittance in 2020 is the same because some of the 19 remittances happened in 20 due to a delay in billing. However, our business is 40% less than 2019 as per 1099 from the payer. Uh, that's a great, great point, especially if you've got it on a 1099. Um, if you look at your whole year, and it is 25% or more down on gross revenue, you can qualify just on that. You don't have to look at quarter by quarter. Um, I would think you would qualify. I'm a little confused though, because your remittances should go, the deposits, the 1099 they go on should be the year in which they were actually paid. In your case, I would definitely look at maybe looking at accrual basis because that's where you're gonna really see the decrease because you're gonna, if you're going cash basis and your billing got delayed and a lot of 19 paid in 20 and say we're talking about a lot, then 20 is gonna look higher than 19. But if you could go back and do an accrual basis and say, this is what we earned and built in, in 19, this is what we should have billed for, doesn't matter what date you build it. It matters when you provided the services versus these are the services we provided in 20 and there's a decrease, <clears throat> then you qualify on that regardless of when the deposits actually came in and regardless of when you actually build it, okay? So that's uh, that answers those. And it looks like somebody raised their hand. Um, okay, I don't know how to do that. Um, all right, so I feel like we're good with questions. So let's move into, where's my clock? 
pretty good on time. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I like to talk. I love to be useful and helpful to you guys. In this forum, I'm able to answer questions a lot better than one-off emails. We're really getting to where I can't answer all the email <coughs> questions that come in via email. And what I'm doing is directing you back to webinars. Um, so if you have questions, I'm happy to stay on as long as we need to and answer those questions. So this is the last section. It's this employee retention credit. This came about <coughs> early, you know, with the original CARES Act. <clears throat> the design was to reimburse employers for keeping their employees on payroll, keeping them paid, even if they weren't working, trying to keep the country employed. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And therefore keeping them off of unemployment. Okay. That's kind of some of the intent behind this. I'm sorry. One last thing I wanted to mention on PPP. I don't have exact numbers in front of me. But the rate at which the funding is being allocated out to loans is way slower than in the prior, you know, original run. The average loan right now is under $100,000. So what's happening is it's taken a lot, the process has taken a lot longer because there are very small, there's a whole bunch of people applying for really small loans. So like my sister, her little $7,000 loan, it takes them just as long to process her paperwork as it does to process a $700,000 loan. So the money is being spent way slower. So there is not, every professional out there is saying there is no way they're gonna run out of money. So that's good. Um, the due date for applying for um, either of the round one, cause you didn't take it when it was originally offered, or round two, the second draw, the deadline is March 31st. You have until March 31st. Um, there is no late fee. They'll just cut it off and quit accepting applications. Um, I was told if we already have a PPP loan for the first round, you do not need to submit another application for loan two. That is wrong. Um, that's absolutely wrong. It would have been great. Um, I, I don't know what this email is pdcreckons at sba.gov, that might've been a spam. We're already seeing phishing emails with regards to these SBA uh, loans and PPP round two, because all the bad guys got really smart or not smart, but they you know kind of jumped on the bandwagon. We're already seeing a lot of phishing. You need to be very careful. No, you have to absolutely apply again. You've got to do all the calculations again. You've got to submit it again. Everything has to be signed. <clears throat> and this time the SB, the bank, what happened in the original run is you applied with the bank and bank just submitted it to the SBA. And SBA said, no, 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 no. You guys are getting paid 5% of these loans. It depends on how big the loan is. You need to review it before you send it to us. So that's what's really slowed down. Um, we are seeing that our loans are taking at least two weeks just to get, once it's submitted, to get reviewed and then sent on to the SBA or even to ask for, for more information. The original thought was this was going to be an additional draw, like a second draw, just going back to your same bank and saying, hey, I want a, a second draw, same amount, no facts have changed. Here's my proof that our revenue dropped. And that was it. Not the case, not the case at all. So honestly, what we've done is we found a, um, we partnered with a product out of AICPA because we were working with all these different banks and it was just kind of a nightmare. It's hard to keep up with. It's hard, you know, they got banking links and links were only good for 24 hours. And it was just, it was hard. We went with a product that puts it all into one place for us. It's a separate lender. We've got a portal. <clears throat> we've put every one of our loans through there. It's getting funded on the back end by a fintech company. Um, and so that's what we're doing. So we, our loans aren't even going back to the original lender because you do have to completely apply all over again. So I'm really glad that you asked that question and I hope that clears it up for you. Um, <clears throat> I am so sorry, y'all. I think I'm gonna start moving my presentations back to like 11 o'clock so I can get through the morning, get my allergies settled. Um, I'm a big allergy sufferer. Um, uh, 
Uh, let's see. Um, regarding PPP loan usage for payroll, can 1099 recipient use in their, and then, uh, yes. Okay, let me make sure I understand this question completely. So with regards to contractors, 1099 contractors, if you're the employer, you received a PPP loan, your contractors, you don't get to use your loan on paying them. That does not, those are not qualified uses. Um, and you don't get to count their payroll as part of your payroll to increase your loan size. Um, they did come in and said they, SBA and, and Congress came in and said, we, we have one of these in the original rush on loans. Originally, it said you can include contract labor. And so one guy got a loan bigger than what he should have gotten, spent it all on payroll, not on contract labor, but the loan was big because he included contract labor in the numbers. Um, excuse me, if they were to audit that loan, basically they would say, okay, we're not going to forgive the amount that was given to you based on contract labor numbers, even though you spent it on payroll, we're not going to forgive it. You got to pay it back over the term of the five years, 1% interest. Um, so that, that's a piece of this question. I'm trying to be super thorough. Now, if you're a contractor or you have contractors that want to get their own PPP loan, that's how it's supposed to work. If you are an independent contractor, it does not matter if you have an EIN number. So you've got your own little business, you've got an EIN number, maybe you're an LLC or whatever, or if you're just an individual, Amy Knight, out doing PT visits, because that's what I do, and I just use the social security number, you can qualify for your own PPP loan on either one of those. I am not well versed on the, um... <laughs> yes, Frank, I should hydrate the day before. I do hydrate, and I have not been drinking beer, so I'm not dehydrated. I'm just like, need time to get going in the morning. And I had a long, rough night with my sick little chihuahua kept getting me up in the middle of the night. I don't have kids. And I tap my husband I'm like, babe, you got to get up next. I, I, I've got a presentation tomorrow. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sorry. I digress. Um, I'm not well versed in the PPP loan application do's and don'ts for independent contractors. It depends on if you follow Schedule C. The broad that I know, they're going to look at what was your 2019 or 2020, because if you didn't do it then and you qualified, you can do it now. And it can be based on 2019 or 2020. What was your, your income? And they're going to look at your Schedule C income, the amount you will pay by all the people you work for, whether it's Schedule C because you use your Social Security number, or it is um, <clears throat> if you've got a single member LLC and you're taxed as an S Corp. Like it depends on what tax form you file. So there's a lot of different rules on that, but yes, you do qualify. <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, those of you that know me from a long time, <clears throat> you know, I'm super scratchy and I did have sinus surgery and I do think it's helping, but yeah, I'm, I'm a little congested and I really like, I, I, I can feel the inflammation in my sinuses right now. It hasn't been long enough. Okay, a small banquet event hall, new company, one man show, no payroll generated in 19, worked all year in 19. Do I qualify for second round due to no income in 20? I did not apply for PPP in 20. I think you would probably, this is Abby, I think you would probably apply for the round one. So just be clear when you go to a lender, I think you would qualify for round one now. <clears throat> so, um, you qualify if you were in business as of 2020, uh, uh, February 15, 2020, you would have qualified. So um, banquet hall event though, or banquet event hall, you might check into, I don't know anything about it. Again, it's not my world. Is this, it's called the Shuttered Venue Grant. Look into that. That's a grant. Um, you're a venue and you were probably shuttered because of the whole event. Um, that might be something you might, benefit from. So I would check into that. Okay, let me get into this employer tax credit and keep hydrating. 
So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of what changed on the employer employee retention credit. Originally, it was set up that if you, so for 2020, so the rules, this 2020 column still applies um, because you can go back and claim this credit for prior quarters. So let's be clear about that. But then in 2021, it applies to first quarter, second quarter, 2021. I don't know if it'll be extended if the pandemic continues, but we'll have to wait and see. But 2021 has different rules um, or different limits and, and such. So for last year, you had to have shown a 50% revenue reduction in a given quarter versus the quarter in 19 to qualify. Um, again, you had to, no PPP, you know, was the case. That is changed. Now all PPP borrowers can participate. And this grant, this graph isn't perfect. I'm sorry, you guys, this is just complicated and trying to get it all into a pretty presentation is hard. Um, in 20, it's limited to small employers with under 100 employees. I don't think SBA alternative size is going to apply here. I think you really have to have under 100 employees. That's going to weed out a lot of you guys. But if you look on the 2021 side, it's going to open it up. So in 2021, you only have to show a 20% reduction in revenue. Um, it's open to everybody. And again, everybody can now also go back into 2020. But now it opens it up to employers with less than 500 employer employees. In 20, the credit is 50% of, of $10,000 per employee, which is $5,000 per employee annually. Jump over to 2020. Now they're saying 70% of $10,000 per employee, but it's per quarter, okay? Um, in 2020, you could not increase salaries to maximize the credit. So you couldn't start paying people more to maximize and max out the credit. Now there's no restriction on that. So you can. Um, can you request an advance on the credit? Apparently you can, but we don't have guidance on how to do that. So it's kind of a moot point right now. Um, eligibility. Last year, this is where it gets super complicated. Eligibility for 2020 is that one quarter has to be down 50% in gross revenue for versus the prior the, the same quarter in 2019. And then that credit, you're still eligible. It continues quarter after quarter until you're back up to 80% revenue of that quarter in the prior year. Now, so that's still there. But now you in 2021, if you qualified in the prior quarter, it qualifies you for the current quarter. We're going to dig into some examples. I'm sure Eric, that is clear as mud because that's how I feel. Um, I see some more PPP. I want to make sure we answer those. Okay. PPP forgiveness application are due 10 months after the end of your covered period. So whatever your covered period is, 10 months. I say, don't wait, go ahead and get it in. Um, we are not working on those right now. We did put them on hold until we're done with PPP2 loan applications. Um, and then what's the difference between SBA industry size standard versus SBA alternative size standard? This is a question for our lender, question from our lender. Frank, will you email me that question? Because I'm not sure. And, I, and let me look it up for you. Is the amount my agency received from the HHS stimulus a loan that my agency has to pay back? No, but that's a much deeper conversation. And Gilda, I recognize you from my inbox and my email. And I'm not sure if it got you answered yet. I think I did. Um, there is, look for any of my webinars that talk about HHS Provider Relief Fund. It can be a grant and not be recouped if you uh, properly justify using the money. But that's a whole nother webinar. It takes a whole nother hour to go through that. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but by the way, if you're not already registered, the TAC Winter Conference is next week. 
and that is I am speaking on Tuesday the 9th and so I have a session with them honestly I need to find out how long that session is um and we'll be going through these things again I don't know if I'll get into the employee retention credit because I definitely need to touch on PPP2 HHS provider relief fund and then I might be able to touch on this a little bit um so let's look at some examples. This is the only way I can wrap my head around this. And I still have to really think about it hard um, before I can't like just blurt out an answer, a quick answer, because that's how complicated it is. Um, I do catering, another question popped up. I do catering from home, but I am not registered as a business. I, as a caterer from home, can I apply for the, uh, yes. Okay. The caterer at home, as long as you claim that on your income tax return, that you have business, here's how much I did in business, even without payroll, what they're going to do is they're going to look at your quote payroll, what you made for 2019 or 2020, what your income was, and they're going to give you two and a half times that average monthly rate. So yes, you would qualify for that. I, I recommend going to a bank uh, or somebody to help you with that process. Uh, if anybody needs a lender, we have, I will put it in chat right now. Uh, Vista Bank was amazing. They are, um, they're, they only have one location here in Austin. I think it's vistabank.com. Um, they were awesome. So if you work with a big bank like Chase, you're not going to get a live person. Vista Bank will take care of you. Um, okay, I put that in slide. So on to this example. Here's an example. Let's go through it. You've got in one quarter corner. You've got your. Um, I'm going to try to get myself a pointer. You've got the. Um, well, clearly I'm not very good at that. Okay, never mind. You got 2019 gross receipts. Okay, we're going to make it easy. You, you had 300 thousand every quarter. Then in 2020, your um, receipts changed. So first quarter, you're still rocking and rolling. Second quarter, you took a huge hit. Third quarter, you kind of rebounded a little bit. Fourth quarter, you've started rebounding and getting back to where you were. So what does this mean in, in, in gross revenue? So your 2020 revenue was 100% of 2019. No reduction there. Do you qualify? No. In second quarter, your revenue was only 33% of the prior year. Therefore, your reduction is 67%, which is more than 25%. So you qualify. There's a reason why on the example, we're going by how much is your, what is the percent of your 2020 revenue versus 2019 how much is the revenue, not how much is the decline, because the way the regs are written, it's talking about how much is the revenue, not what is your decline. And so it gets into this 80% rule, and it's easier to understand this way. So what we're looking for is anything that 75% or lower you qualify, okay? So this is clearly less than 75% of the prior year you qualify. This is clearly less than 75% of the prior year. You qualify for that quarter. This is 2020 again. So we're under 2020 rules. Oh, well, this is 83% of the prior year. Why do I qualify? You qualify because the rules read that you qualify. So once you start qualifying in quarter two, you continue to qualify until your revenue is 80% of the prior year. And in the quarter that you reach, that you get back up to 80%, you still qualify for that quarter, just not any past it. That's the clearest mud part. This is as simple as I can make it. And I don't find it simple. So if you don't get it, don't feel bad. It, it, it's not easy to comprehend. Um, that's an example. Let's go to another example. And I really do need to try to get me a pointer. Where's my little pointer? Oh, here we go, laser pointer. Well, whatever, it's just not cooperating for me. Um, next example. 
well, oh, there we go. No, y'all, I apologize when my technical skills are not working right now and I need to just turn it off so I can advance my slide. I wanna make sure I didn't skip to me. Okay, that's our first example of 2020. Okay. Here's another example of 2020. Same scenario for 19, a little bit different scenario for 20. So in first quarter, you're still 100% of the prior year's revenue. Second quarter drops, you're only 33%. So you clearly qualify. Third quarter, you jump on up to 80% of the prior year and you get to qualify still for that quarter but then you no longer qualify in fourth quarter because it is 75%. And I misspoke in the very beginning. I'm telling you, that's how complicated this is. Your original drop, your revenue needs to be 50% or less of the prior year. I said 75%, 50% or less. So let me go back and I really apologize, you guys. You're... At 33%, you're less than 50%. You're at 47, still less than 50. Then you jump up to 83. Now you're over the 80%. So now you qualify for that final quarter, but not anything after it, unless you drop 50% again. So then in this example is 100%, you're good. Here, you dropped more than 50%, you qualify. Now you've jumped up to 80%, so you rebounded. You qualify for that quarter because that's how the regs are written. But then fourth quarter, you slip a little bit, but you don't slip enough to go back below 50% and qualify a, a, as a new start of the tracking, okay? Again, this is super complicated. Um, I, I don't know how to make it any more simple. Um, I'm thankful to my friend Pepper Horton. These are actually his examples that he put together and I simply copy and pasted. That's what us CPAs, the smart ones do. Okay, first quarter, here's 2021, a little bit different. 2021, same example you got. So now you're, you're comparing 21 back to 19, okay? So catch that. Um, and this needs to be updated. This should say 21. I don't know why this little, this right there. Oh, cause now I have a totally different pen. Okay. Telling you, I really am more technical than what this shows. I don't know. Let me just fix out of that. Okay. There it is. This should be 2021. Again, I'll update that before I send out a final call. That's why I don't usually give out the slides cause I always find a typo or two. Um, so the first quarter, now remember, new rules for 2020. One, you only have to show a reduction, uh, you only have to show a reduction of income of 20%, okay, 20%. So anything less than 80% of prior year's revenue, you qualify. So here we are, you got 75% versus, not prior year, versus 19, you qualify. Well, then you jump back up but you still qualify in 2021 because for the current quarter, you can look back at the prior quarter. So you can say, all right, it's second quarter. I don't qualify on this quarter alone, but I qualified last quarter. So I get to deduct this quarter. I get to claim it this quarter. Now, if for whatever reason it is extended, you didn't qualify second quarter, unless you qualify on its own and third, you can't look back and say, well, I got to take the credit just because you got to take the credit doesn't mean you actually were eligible and that quarter didn't qualify. So you, so in 2021, you can now do a look back. So what I don't have an example of is what if the fourth quarter 2020, you qualified, not by 50%, which was the 2020 rule, but the 2021 rule says I can look back one quarter, and it's only got to be 80% or less, or probably 79% or less of, the, of 2019 revenue. So if fourth quarter was down, you can then claim it in first quarter. 
it did fourth quarter won't qualify under the 2020 rules, but by using a look back, it qualifies your first quarter in 2021. Let's back up to this uh, other slide. So if this was your example, you did not qualify for fourth quarter, but you're less than 80% of your revenue and you jump into first quarter, now you can do a look back and you would, have, you would qualify even if first quarter right here was 100%. So really, you know what? And I'll try to do this. I'll do this before I send this out. I'll do another slide that says 2021 with look back that adds fourth quarter 20 in here and says, all right, under the 21 rules, you get to look back a prior quarter. So I have some clients that I think are gonna qualify based on this look back rule. So they can look back to fourth quarter, it's down 20% or more. So they're gonna qualify for first quarter. Um, now let's say, what is the credit? That's a good question. I still have scribbly scratches. I don't know how to get that off of there. I'll deal with that afterwards. Um, what is the credit? Here's how the credits work. This is 2020. Again, it's a little bit different rule for 20 versus 21. In 20, you're getting a 50% credit. And you're only getting that credit on the wages as a whole annual number per employee. So employee A, you paid $15,000 per quarter. Well, 10,000 of their wages are qualified wages in second quarter. So let's say you qualified second, third, and fourth quarter. Um, you only get to count, and he's paid 15,000 per quarter. You only get to count 10,000 in that first quarter that you're eligible because he's no longer eligible because now you've capped him out. Employee B is paid 7,000 per quarter. Well, you get to claim seven, the full 7,000 in the first quarter you're eligible because it's you, he hasn't hit his cap, but then in the second quarter that you're eligible, he hit his cap and you only get to include the 3,000. So now he's at his $10,000 cap. And then employee C is just, let's say they're part-time. They um, are, you get to deduct 3,000, not deduct, qualified wages of 3,000 per quarter by the end of three quarters, they're only at 9,000, so they haven't even capped out yet. That's how 2020 works. So then you add up your qualified wages per quarter and you apply a 50%, that's what your credit would be. You guys out there in home care world, you know how much wages you pay. This could add up very quickly. Now, let's go to a 2021 example. Now you're at employee wages per quarter, same, same facts, but now your cap is 10,000, is it 10,000? I almost have to go back to my own slides, per quarter per employee. I think that's right. So our $15,000 person that's paid 15 per quarter, Quarter one, you get to count 10,000. Quarter two, you get to count 10,000. If, if you're eligible, then you get to count those qualified wages. You get to count 10,000 every quarter. The $7,000 person, same thing, 3,000, same thing. So this higher earner, they are capped at 10,000 per quarter, but it's 10,000 per quarter instead of 10,000 for the whole year, which is what 2020 was. So now you add up your qualified wages, and the credit is now 70%, okay? So it's a bigger credit. You can see how fast that can add up. Now, the big question, well, this is not the proper, um, I, let me just address it, I, I, my slides. You cannot double dip PPP loan and employer tax credit. So if you have, Wage, let's say you qualified in second quarter of 20 because, or let's say third quarter. You qualified in third quarter of 20 because that's when a lot of Texas, we really started feeling the impact in May, June, July. So that rolls into third quarter. You know, you qualify and um, you got your PPP loan about that same time. You can't use PPP loan on these wages and claim a credit. 
So there has to be some planning done. I'll get to that more in a little bit. Let's go through the rest of this. You're not allowed to deduct wages in the amount of the credit. So like the question comes up, how is this taxable? Basically, you're, it's, it's, um, it's basically taxable, the credit itself. That's the easiest way to think about it. Um, you don't, you're not gonna get some kind of 1099 income based on how much credit you took, but you're not allowed to deduct those wages as wages on your income tax return. So if you, if you got a credit of $10,000, then you need to reduce your wages by $10,000 that are claimed on your tax return as deduction. The easier way to do it is show an other income for the amount of credit taken. That's the much easier way, okay? So it is taxable. There's no question to that. Um, I'm still kind of cracking up about my little scribble up there. Sorry about that. Um, the only restrictions on related parties are children, siblings, parents, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, nephews, et cetera. There's no limits on owners or owner spouses. I'm gonna tell you to err on the side of caution. Don't go put everybody on payroll that wasn't already on payroll, which is what this restriction is. Don't, don't do that, right? To, uh, remember the saying, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Keep that in mind. Use what's available to you. Don't be greedy. Greedy leads to audits and you know, it, it, it's, you'll get slaughtered. Um, great question, Louise. Um, yes, this can be done retroactively. So here's here, let me get into that discussion. So since you can't double dip, you've got to do some planning. If you haven't already filed for forgiveness, you've got a lot more flexibility. Um, we, so here's an example. You are a PAS provider. You have a whole bunch of lower paid employees. Could you, um, okay, here, this was a thought. There was a thought that on these step round two loans, like, okay, should we wait until the very end of the quarter? Because if they, if you get a PPP loan this week, we're just now starting February. Are they going to end, but you also uh, are eligible for the employee retention credit because now they dropped it to 20% reduction. So you're like, hey, I'm in. But, oh, I got a PPP loan. Man, I'd rather use my employee retention credit before my PPP loan. Well, they have not been that verbal about it, but they did come out and say, something along the lines of giving you the freedom. They, they came out and said, they didn't say you do not have to apply PPP funds first and then earn income credit. They said something about letting you choose what you do. So we're not as quite concerned about that anymore. Um, we're not as concerned about PPP money running out. Um, of course, there's always a risk of the IRS changing the rules really need to think about, let's talk through some planning. If you haven't filed for forgiveness and you're eligible for third quarter, I haven't run the numbers myself, but could you look at, you know, depending on when you got your PPP loan, could you look at saying, well, I'm gonna go back and apply for the credit for these first six weeks and then start applying PPP funds for the next weeks. Like you still have 24 weeks to work in, right? Um, what, what has become less of a concern, and it was a concern in the early days, was we were saying, hey, you put this money in a separate account, and as you pay payroll, you reimburse yourself. Let, that's far less of a concern. So let's say you did that, and you're like, look, I did it, I was perfect, I followed your advice, and we spent it, it took us 10 weeks, we spent every dime exactly as we should, and that's how our transfers were. And now you're saying I could go back and say, well, I'm going to use employee retention credit for those first few weeks, and then I'm going to use PPP loan later because we didn't qualify for ERC. So I'm going to use PPP funds, and I'm going to use it from weeks, you know, say it took you 10 weeks to spend it, you're going to use it from week 11 to 21. 
Like there's planning opportunities there. To me, that's not taking advantage of anything. That's not being a hog and getting slaughtered. Being a hog is trying to put every cousin, every relative you have on payroll to get some credits for them. Um, that's not cool, right? Um, there's a lot of planning there. Now, of our providers that we're working for, I've got very few that can show a 50% reduction, but there are some, there are some, right? But as we move into 2021, um, a 20% reduction versus 19, yeah, yeah. At, based on fourth quarter, yeah, we've got some of those. And so there was this concern, should we wait and not apply for PPP2 until the very end of the quarter so that we can use ERC for all of Q1 this year and then PPP for Q2, but that's kind of not as important. Again, you still can't double dip. So if you you know qualify for Q1 on Q1 itself and that therefore you know you're gonna be eligible to, to claim the credit in Q2, you still have 24 weeks that you can put your PPP off. I mean, there's just some planning opportunities there. Um, if you've already applied for forgiveness, you can't go back and change that. So you just have to know what wages were used as your PPP wages. You cannot use those for employee, the ERC. Um, now let's say, let's say that it's second quarter, which is effectively, let's say it's 12 weeks long and you used your PPP loans for the first 10 weeks, you got two weeks left, by all means, you can go get that ERC for that two weeks. You just can't double dip and you need to be able to really show that and be very, very clear with your payroll documentation. Um, that is the end of my slides. Um, what, what other questions? I, uh, let's see, I do have a, hold on. My home care business opened up in September of 19. How do I show a reduction? So if you open late in the year, there are special rules for how you show a reduction of services. And I'll be honest, I'm not brushed up on those rules. Um, so you would need to just go, if you go, find um, PPP loan FAQs. There is, you should be able to Google for that. It used to be very easy to find on the treasury website. They've since kind of hidden it. Although I will, let me stop sharing because I bookmarked it because it was hard to, um, it was hard to find. So let me get out of this slideshow and I will, I'll, I'll put that in the um, chat channel because I did bookmark this. But the treasury side has no longer got it. Like they used to have a red banner across the top and it was really easy to find. And that has since gone away. So let me drop this into the chat. PPP FAQs. Okay. Um, you might bookmark that. There's a lot of FAQs out there. Um, I will go ahead and share again because I did have, uh, well, you'll have, you, the, all of our contact info is in the slides. If you're registered, you, you're, you know my email address at this point, I'm pretty sure. Um, but what I am, I'm happy to answer as many questions as I can. I will say on the ERC, we, we will be probably offering that as a service. Um, I think we plan to charge a percent of the credit and there may be a flat minimum fee that then could be applied to the credit. Um, I, that's what I think we're gonna structure. I just need to know what the minimum fee is. Um, and the way we will do that is we'll charge the flat fee. And then when you get the credit, then you owe us the, I think 15% and we'll reduce it by the amount you already paid us. Um, that's how we're looking at doing it. Um, I don't know what other providers are charging. That seems to be, I've heard 10 to 20% in my realm. I have heard there are um, R&D credit guys. So that's research and development. I heard they're charging 30%. Um, so I felt pretty comfortable with 15. Um, it's gonna be a lot of work. Um, it right now is only applicable through March, through um, second quarter 2021, which is June 30th. And I'm not sure the due date in which you have to go back and apply for that. 
I'll have to look at that. So let me answer some more questions. New business started in October, 2019. And am I still available to apply for round two? Yes, it would be round one is reopened. Uh, you should be able to apply for that. With the 2021 ERC, hi Kirk, um, can Q1 only look back at Q4 or can Q1 have a 20%? Yeah, so Kirk, what, what we can do is we can look back, it, it's optional, either or. You either can qualify on your own, Q1 is down 20%, which then makes Q2 eligible automatically, or you can look back at Q4. If Q1 on its own does not qualify, then you look back at Q4. Was Q4 down by 20% or more? If so, Q1 is eligible, but it doesn't automatically make Q2 eligible. So that's how that works. Um, thank you for being here. Um, my husband owns an LLC and remodels and renovates homes. He does all the work, but he does not have a payroll per se. He has Schedule C. He did not take the loan, didn't know how to prove it. And he didn't think he could make that. Okay, I, again, I am not well-versed on the Schedule C, but definitely go seek a either a small business accountant. I absolutely have friends that I could put you in touch with. I actually have one that, <clears throat> A, she's super cool. <clears throat> and they do a lot of um, contractors. So she's well-versed on it. And she's done a lot with PPP. Um, it's in my little network of people. He, here's the thing with Schedule C. Basically, they're just going to give you two and a half times your average from, the, from 2019. You don't have to justify spending it in any way. It's almost like automatically forgiven. Because you qualified, you're going to keep it as replacement income for yourself. You don't have to worry about eight weeks or 24 weeks. You just get it. That's, there's money out there. Um, it's really, really I think why they opened up round one again. So please have them. And if you want my contact, just email me. And I'll be happy to put you in touch with them. Um, so you would amend your 941 to apply for prior year credit. Yes, prior quarter credit. I'm going to say yes loosely. Um, I think it's going to require an amended 941. But then there's a form 7200, 7020. 7,002 something that is um, where you can apply like for a rapid credit. Don't expect anything rapidly from the IRS right now. It's, they're so delayed. Um, and the reason that I'm not real well versed in the actual mechanics of it is because it's taken me this long to get my head wrapped around the eligibility of it. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's been tough. So, you know, and I feel like my audience always gives me a lot of grace in not knowing all the answers, and I appreciate that. So that's why I don't wait until I know all the answers to get out here and tell you. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I'm pretty sure, going to require some amended 941s. Unless they come out with some form that just says, hey, we created a new form, but I just don't expect that. Also, with ERC, does that also apply to PRN and part-time employees? No. This is straight pay. Well, excuse me. I'm sorry. Kurt, yes. If they're employees, yes. Um, some people say PRN and mean contractors. If they're actual employees, W-2 employees that go on your 941, that's who it applies to. It does not apply to, um, oh, we didn't go through the flow chart. Let's do that. It does not apply to contractors. Let me show you how to read these flow charts because there are a couple of qualifications especially for any of you guys that are not home care, um, because I know home care really kept people working. So let me pull this up and uh, let me, let, let's do 2020. And then let me share my screen with this. 2020 PDF share. Okay. So you should be able to see this flow chart. I'm going to uh, run away, see if I can't. There we go. Just a little bit. You're going, well, maybe not. Okay, you're going to start by asking yourself this very first question. There is, if you were suspended from business, like literally you were shut down, restaurant, bar, if you were suspended fully or partially suspended, like even the restaurants in Austin right now, they're back at 75% capacity, but they're partially suspended. There are kind of different set of rules for that. If you're suspended, yes, 
All right, did you have fewer than 100 client, uh, employees? Yes, then you qualify. No, I have more than 100 employees. Were you paying employees that were not providing any services? Yes, then you qualify. So listen, <clears throat> if you were a PAS, and we'll get to it, none of the home cares and hospice and nursing, none of our healthcare providers were suspended from operations. Now, elective surgery, you were suspended, but not the home care that then serviced elective surgery recoveries. Not That's not the same. But if your business was governmentally shut down, um, that you get a separate set of rules. So let's keep going through this. So were you suspended? No, this is gonna be most of our home care. So we weren't suspended. Were your grocery receipts less than 50% of the prior quarter? Yep. Did you have less than 100 employees? Yep then you qualify. But no, I wasn't less than 50%. Um, did any quarter, so this is asking was the whole, was the current quarter? No. Was any quarter? Nope. Then you got no relief. Yes. And then you go through, I'm not going to walk you through that part. What I want to get at is, did you have a hundred or fewer employees? No. Were you paying any employees that did not provide services? So you need to really work through this to see, do you really qualify? But again, you had to, that's only gonna be relevant for those over a hundred employees for 2020. So like Louise, you know, I, I'm not sure your employee count. Um, you know, and so if you qualify on these other bases, but you have more than hundred employees, you might qualify at least for those that were literally sitting at home, some attendant, you wanted to keep them on payroll and you paid them. You qualify. However, in that case, you only qualify for the wages paid to them while they were not working. Again, up to those limits. In addition, there's more information over here on the side about this. <clears throat> um, if you were shut down, your wages qualify only for the date in which you were shut down. So if you ever shut down part of second quarter, it doesn't automatically qualify you for the whole second quarter. So these are some really good flow charts. Here's 2021, a little bit different because the numbers change. Very, very similar, but now you've got 500 employees. That's the key. And then our gross receipts less than 80% instead of 50%, right? That makes a big difference in the prior year or prior quarter. Otherwise, you keep working through the same steps and uh, the other, you know, pretty much the same rules apply. Those are going to be very, very handy for each of you to individually assess your situation. I think they're written, I, honestly, I didn't even look at to see if they were branded by anybody. My other buddy, Glenn Hanner, uh, shared those. And so, you know, we, we like to share things amongst each other, save everybody time. Um, I find those very handy. That's why I wanted to put them in your hands today during this session. Um, and that's, they're in those links. Again, if you didn't go to the chat and download it, A, it's there, um, but it will come out on the follow-up email tomorrow, which will also have the recording and the slides. So all of that will be attached. We'll get those all um, sent out for you. So. I don't have any further questions at this time, but see, look, it's 1130. My voice has kind of cleared up, feeling a little bit better. I don't know, my sinuses still hurt. Um, not hurt, but they don't feel great today. Um, that's all I got. I don't see any more questions coming in. I appreciate you guys as always. I'm really honestly wanting to get past all of this COVID related discussions. I, I already um, chatted with my business coach who is a CPA firm, a previous firm owner. And um, we do what's called EOS, Entrepreneur Operating System. And it's an amazing way. It's a framework to run any kind of business. And um, he's agreed to come on and do some webcast with me. He's out of South Carolina. So we would do that and, and really kind of talk to you more about like running a business and you know, getting some key metrics and some scorecards to measure your business by um, and how to run with that and, and just setting up 
you know, your man, your leadership team, your management team, things like that, that um, I just think home care and our healthcare world would um, really find benefit in. So I'm trying to get to some of that, but when there's such relevant topics that need to be discussed, I really want to, you know, focus on those first. So anyways, I appreciate you guys. Thank you all for being here. I'll sign off now and I hope everybody has a blessed rest of your week. And I hope to see many of you, if not everybody at the Texas Home Care Association Winter Conference next week. Um, if you need registration, email me. I'm sure I can find it. Otherwise, just go to their website. It's TAC, T-A-H-C-A.org. And I know it's right there on the homepage. So, all right. Thank you, guys.